Uh, uh, Carolyn, you ready to ready to do your thing? Sure. In between, in the middle of this, I'm going to uh, be um, switching over to my, my computer as soon as it opens up. But uh, right now, uh, welcome to everybody. We're on the Columbus Free Press Salon in, in November 12th, uh, the week after the uh, 2022 midterm elections. And so we wanted to do a quick sort of reflection of, uh, by four of our sort of critical voices that we have. And Carolyn uh, Harding, as she said, she just turned 21 and she's happy uh, to do her thing. Uh, but she was one of our local uh, candidates as well. So she has sort of an inside track on all that. And so we'll start with you so you can get on. I know you have other plans. So you go ahead, do your thing. And then we'll talk a little bit more as we roll this conversation on. Uh, take your impact. We sort of want to look at where we're looking at, uh, where we're, uh, our reflections, our impressions are, the impact of the elections on the international, national, and local levels. Um, take the bite wherever you would like to take that bite, though. Go ahead, Carolyn. Thank you. Okay. Hi, guys. So good to see everybody. Hey, um, so oh, I ran for Ohio State Rep in District, well, it ended up being District 1 and um, didn't know what district it would be when I, when I jumped into the race back in February. I did know that my rep, um, Kristen Boggs, was running for judge. So I felt like we needed a strong um, voice for women's reproductive rights. And then of course, all um, also issues, uh, Medicare for all, um, pub free public education through university and um, uh, qualif ending qualified immunity. So I uh, jumped into the race and um, I, you know, I, I'm a, I come from the arts. I've been doing Grassroot Ohio radio for three and a half years. And before that I've been work involved, very involved in environmental activism, protecting our water from fracking, frack waste injection wells and dumping with the Columbus Community Bill of Rights, which you guys all are all probably familiar with. And we're not done, but, Long story short, I decided to step up and run and not really knowing what I was doing. And uh, I got my first foray into um, public, public office um, in the Franklin County Democratic Party Central Committee. I ran with Rep. Your per Will um, Petrick. Hi, Will Perkins, I almost called your name. Will Petrick um, and a bunch of us got elected into the Franklin County Democratic Party. However, none of us have been embraced very wholeheartedly. We've been the thorn in their flesh. We're luck, I'm a burner. Um, I'm um, very progressive. So we've been held under suspect. Well, I ended up running against an, a very friendly um, endorsed incumbent, um, Dontavious Geralds, a young black man. And, um, you know, even the progressives had a hard time that I was, you know, running against a young black man. And I can even understand people's ambivalence. However, um, soldier and he would not, he would not stand up for Medicare for all. And I'm pretty confident he wouldn't stand up for with fracking and those kinds of issues. But long story short, I got a lot of pushback from the Democratic Party for running and um, and not a lot of support, no blatant, um, you know, hatred or blatant blockades, but um, folks that I've worked with helped me in a great, great way. My, I had two paid uh, folks, Greg Pace and Michelle Hendricks, my um, treasurer and my campaign manager, and we learned a whole lot. Um, that was a goal of mine to pay them a living wage, and I did. And we didn't have a lot of money, but some folks gave us money. Some folks here in this um, group have um, donated money. I did experience uh, um, the repercussion to get donations and have people want you to do certain things for them with because they gave you money. But the majority of folks weren't like that. So um, the thing that was great was knocking on doors. 
I loved going into communities I'd never been into before, um, talking with people about the issues, talking about not endorsing um, before primaries, letting the people um, to, um, listen, learn um, about the candidates because in Franklin County, those sample ballots are like what people go by and they, you know, even for primaries. So um, I thought I really tried to educate folks about that. I told them that I would, I'm strong for Medicare for all and um, for women's reproductive rights. And, you know, Roe v. Wade was overturned right during the campaign. So um, that was where I, where I, I really put my focus. Um, so, um, but I lost, I got 35% of the vote. I chose, we didn't really have enough money to do a mailer because they're like six to $10,000 just to the Democrats. And um, I wanted, I wanted to cover my, my costs and honor my commitments. So we did, we knocked the doors and we had lots of volunteers at the um, polls um, with our, my palm card. So we did really well. We were pretty much an independent campaign and, um, and, um, and I had incredible volunteers. And some of the progressive leaders really helped me out. Morgan Harper did and Brian um, Cox. Brian, right? Brian Cox, yes. And um, Will Petrick, and then so many incredible volunteers from the Columbus Community Bill of Rights folks. So what we need, because the craziness, we need ranked choice voting. And it's gaining, um, it's, people are voting for it and it's, it's happening and Ohio needs it. And we need a statewide ballot initiative to in, um, codify women's reproductive rights. Those are the two things that I came away with. Um, I am pretty much blacklisted in the Democratic Party. At this point, they wanted to kick me out, <laughs> kick me out of the um, Central Committee because I ran against an endorsed incumbent. So, mm. <laughs> so it was, it, I don't have a lot of like, I'm, I am, I'm going to move past, move past um, bitterness. <laughs> Is that, you know, it's time to move forward. And I want to use my um, skills the way possible, whether it's to run again, whether it's to focus on Grassroot Ohio, whether it's to create an art artistic um, expression of what's been going on. But, um, I'm kind of giving myself till the new year to figure out what the next step is. Um, I'm still very focused and committed to these issues and to the people of Columbus and Ohio. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm a very progressive um, candidate and I may have to run independent. I don't know. So that's where I'm at and, um, Thank you for every one of you for your hard work, your activism, your issues. I've learned so much. And if it weren't for Bob and Suzanne, you know, Free Press and WGRN um, encouraging me and training me to do my Grassroot Ohio um, radio show, I wouldn't know about so many of these issues because I've been able to interview some of the most interesting, committed, on the um, front lines activists in Ohio. So thanks. That's what I have to say. If you have any thanks. questions. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, yeah, no, we, I don't know how long you can stay, but um, I you, can you stay. mentioned, oh, hmm? I can stay for, for sure. Okay, for, okay for, good. Because uh, we got Morgan going to talk now. I think, I don't think Medea is on yet. So Morgan Harper's available to speak. And you mentioned her but you mentioned <clears throat> sort of three, four different kind of uh, characteristics of a campaign that need to happen. One's money, one's people, for sure people, but money, money, yeah, money, money. And then uh, the little politics, that, or not the little, the serious politics that play out in when you're wanting to play in a party, um, how to play with that party in, in, a, in the way they want to play. 
And then the other one is just getting your, your knowledge of the issues and, and getting to know the people that are out there. Um, and that's come through your WGRN work as well as your, your, your uh, <clears throat> excuse me, your uh, board of, board of, of community rights. Uh, uh, and that, that, that kind of activism, I think, I, I wanna sort of get into where Morgan is in, in her analysis of things as well. Uh, but again, we're, we're trying to focus tonight <clears throat> to remind everybody we're talk, talking about the elections and where we are on the international, national, local level. Um, your campaign was going to be for the state uh, state representative, and and um, that 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 was a big big mouthful to chew on. I think uh, for to the whole thing. So thank you for trying it, and and I think you did a great campaign. It was fun to see your name on the ballot that where I could vote on it, and that, that was fun. I, a lot of our folks weren't able to vote for you, but I I was lucky to do that. So. Um, Morgan, I don't know, Carolyn, we'll get back to you. Just thank you. But Morgan, do you want to speak a little bit about your own experience on how you uh, ran your campaign or, or any other aspects of what, what, what we're talking about tonight, about the elections internationally, national and or local? Sure. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Morgan. And yeah, and actually, Carolyn, I don't know if you saw Sandy's question in the chat, but that was one follow-up I had too of what you mean when you say the parties kicked you out. Is that just de facto, but you still you still hold a central committee position or? Yeah, no, they did not kick me out, but they were voting. Um, they were gonna vote the last meeting if they if someone like me who you know ran even though there was an endorsed candidate. Um, but I, you know, I, I missed that meeting because I was out of town. And so um, I don't think they did. I mean, I haven't heard anything from them. So I'm gonna stay until I finish my, my term. Uh, it's, Gary Fox. it's Gary, thanks. Okay, good. Okay, well, that's good. That's the answer I was hoping for. So I'm happy to hear that that's what's happening, Carolyn. Okay. Me too. Me too. <laughs> um, well, cool. Well, yeah, it's good to see everybody and uh, nice to be through the general election time <laughs> and, and where are we at? So, uh, you know, in terms of my take on things, so we know, of course, that statewide, we didn't have great results. Um, I, I would distinguish, and this is something that, you know, I've been a little bit frustrated in the coverage of, I don't think has, has been distinguished enough is, you know, the governor's race versus the, the Senate race, governor's race, you know, Nan Whaley trying to take out Mike DeWine, a very entrenched incumbent. Uh, was always going to be a super uphill battle, regardless of any changes in policy conditions and Dobbs decision and all of that. And I'm sure that's no surprise to anyone. Um, but the Senate race, you know, that was an open seat. And so as, as you all know, and I, I spoke to this group when I was running in the primary, you know, that is a big opportunity. It's open seats where it is a little bit more of a level playing field. Um, and so the fact that we didn't see much of an improvement on the result that both Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton got in Ohio, despite you know Tim Ryan's campaign being able to raise $48 million, I would say is an indictment of the strategy. Um, I don't know if everyone <laughs> uh, in class in our state would, would be willing to agree with me that, on that publicly, but I, I think that's where we should be landing on this, that the idea that we were gonna be able to get enough Republican Trumpers, whatever you wanna call it, um, to move to another side, to vote for a Democrat who was presenting themselves as maybe being something close to that or adjacent or the same thing in, in certain on certain policy points, um, just to me was not a great strategy and it's exactly why I got in the Senate race. and so. Um, you know, of course, J.D. Vance as our next senator is not a good, a, not a good place for us to be, uh, but I can't say that I was totally surprised by the result. And so, you know, what, what is a better strategy? And I think we have to continue to look at some of the numbers. I mean, especially in Ohio, and the story came out last week, I know a lot of folks saw it, that Oh, Columbus is the only part of the state that's growing, <laughs> right? Everywhere else is losing population and Columbus is growing. So if we don't see major, major turnout in Franklin County in particular, then we don't really have a shot of being competitive. And 
you know, on the bright side of things, I would say there is room for some optimism. You know, there were some House seats in other parts of the state that, you know, Republicans weren't able to win. Uh, we saw some state rep candidates, you know, from the Democratic side of things that were able to win in, in Franklin County that were considered pretty competitive seats for the state house. And so we need to be looking at how we run up that turnout. And you know, someone was asking me this morning about what, what exactly the, the percentage was, because again, in the reporting, you'll just hear, oh, well, you know, in the Senate race, the Democratic Senate, uh, Tim Ryan got 66% of the vote, Franklin County. But when you start breaking that down among all eligible voters in the county, which is over 800,000 about, uh, then that's actually only like 30% of all eligible voters. And, you know, over 600,000 people are not participating in primaries. And so they are independent, unaffiliated, and that is a big chunk of people. And so, you know, moving forward, I, I do think, I know Carolyn mentioned ranked choice voting, you know, that's in other states. Um, that's, that's another tactic to consider. But in the meantime, we also have a ton of people who are not participating in primaries and don't really strongly affiliate um, with either party enough to then show up for a decision of primary, right? And then, you know, adding on that layer of everybody's busy, a lot of people don't pay attention to politics and all of this. So how are we going to continue to broaden the base of people who, once they know about a choice that they might have and somebody who is going to be a little bit more of a um, aggressive protector of the working class, which a lot of folks who are running, you know, with more progressive platforms, I would say, are going to be and not as beholden to the party politics. How do we make sure that folks are hearing about these campaigns and these candidates? And, and that's where uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, maybe tiring <laughs> to some, and I know we all do so much work and I say this, this somebody, you know, I, I'm definitely putting a lot of this into, into all of the, the political sphere as well, but we really can't stop. And so, you know, this is, this is what happens is like, we get through the midterm and then everybody's pretty tired and then it's the holidays and it's like, okay, we're going to take a breather. And then it's January. And then when you look around for the local elections, cause that's really our opportunity to continue to build base and educate people about what the differences are. Not all Democrats are created equal here in these primaries. And you need signatures for that primary in May for our local elections next year by February. And you need like a thousand of them because who knows why, but that's the rule that they've come up with. And that can be daunting to, you know, the average person who's never run for office, for example. And so uh, one of the things that I'm really going to be focused on over the next few weeks is working with uh, people, organizations locally, anyone who's on this call who wants to be part of making sure that we're having as many people as possible joining Joe Motiel to run for local elections in 2023 uh, and supporting them to make sure that we have you know, strong campaigns. And Ohio Working Families Party, I don't know if everyone is aware, we've had a few iterations of, of Working Families Party, but um, they, do, they have hired a new statewide director. Her name is Alina Stark. She is based out of Cleveland, but is coordinating with, with folks across the state. And she's gonna be helping us co-host another session on November 30th for anyone who is interested in learning more, potentially running as a candidate, supporting campaigns as a volunteer, whatever, um, being involved in the local election cycle in 2023. So that'll be November 30th virtual. And I'm excited about the fact that they've hired Alina because that just means that it's another source of of money and organizational resources to be able to support more independent candidates who want to run. And that's a good thing because like Carolyn said, I mean, we, we can have the best policy ideas and, and we saw this in polling that we did in our race towards the end, 80% of Demo likely democratic primary voters in the state of Ohio support Medicare for all, right? Uh, 80% you know, of likely Democratic primary voters in the state of Ohio support a higher minimum wage. But if they don't know about the candidates that are running on these ideas, then it doesn't really matter. And so how do we make sure that more people know about the candidates? Completely agree with Carolyn's analysis. Part of it is money. We're always gonna have a little bit of a handicap there because of the lack of great campaign finance limits, especially for the local elections. But um, but the other piece of it is organization, base building, and especially having people who have, 
you know, even though this is going to be this quasi ward system, that's not really ward system, as we know, it does give people a chance to really focus on a specific geography. And then especially if there's a full slate that can get rolled up into um, an entire citywide organizing strategy that that might be very effective. And so, uh, yeah, social media, I see someone calling out, that's another thing that is free, you know? I mean, yeah. actually at one of the last canvases I did before the general election uh, in Gehanna, somebody was asking me like, what are you know non-traditional ways that we can get through to people? And it's like, TikTok, you know, TikTok, super problematic on a number of fronts, it is addictive, but there are so many people on TikTok, you know, younger folks are using TikTok for internet search instead of Google. And that's trending to be more of their primary information source. Terrifying, terrifying overall for our society, but we got to meet people where they're at. And so we, you know, we can be uh, creative as well in some of these digital, digital tactics. TikTok is owned by uh, it is it, a Chinese company, Chinese state owned. I think that the, the, the government has invested. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why people are nervous about um, just the data that's being involved there and then how there can be changes to the algorithm. Um, but even still, here we are. TikTok's there, Facebook's there. We all have, we're all engaging with it. And, um, and certainly for 2023, I don't anticipate that any of the major social media problems are going to be solved by the signature deadline for our Columbus election. So, so Morgan, <laughs> Morgan and Carolyn, you guys, you're, you're, you've been experienced in running campaigns. And um, one question that came out was, should we, should we introduce issue based and use that as a way to organize around a candidate? Um, so, similar to like a pro-choice ballot initiative or uh, one that is uh, something that's very progressive, Medicare for all, so, something that could be unifying to join behind. Uh, is that a direction that we should go in a campaign? I, I'd be interested in Carol, I'd be interested in Carolyn's thoughts. Well, one, I want to say, you know, completely agree with the analysis. And I'm sure folks have seen this commentary that in terms of, you know, some of these statewide elections that were happening across the country, it did make a huge difference when there was an issue oriented ballot initiative, especially related to uh, abortion rights. For the local elections, I, I really am curious about people's thoughts. I've kind of gone back and forth on it. At first, I, I also was leaning that direction. But in a, a previous meeting we had, we kind of landed on, you know, what might be an interesting issue to focus on is just letting people know about the sample ballot and that their mailers and all this lit they're going to get doesn't actually include everyone who's running because my experience has been a lot of people are um, very frustrated when they hear that and they have no idea that the party would be excluding people who are running. And so just starting early to get in people's heads, like, hey, we actually want a sample ballot or we want mailers that include all of our candidates or something like that, um, you know, is something that would then just be more directly connected to the election, but open to people's thoughts. I think, you know, it could, I could understand arguments both ways and having more of like, you know, a housing related issue campaign that all candidates um, are signing on to or, you know, specific, maybe one specific policy to highlight makes a lot of sense too. Thank you. Carolyn, did you have another perspective on that or an additional to, to that, um, that challenge of what leads us? I mean, for us, a lot of us are uh, 5-1-C-3, so we probably, in, a, in, a, in sort of a weird sense, feel we can't get involved with elections, campaigning a candidacy so much, so much. But we could do issues, you know, you know a little stronger yes. issue. Well, and I and have so a five hundred one c three friendly idea that I'm going to get to, but I'll let Carolyn go and then I'll yeah, come back to that. Please, please, because <laughs> that has been a sort of a challenge for some folks, I think. Yeah. And then, yeah. Well, for me personally, um, really, the the only two big things I would put put my my energy and my time with is besides Columbus Community Bill of Rights and um, Jonathan Beard's, um, can, um, his ballot initiative uh, for tenants' rights um, is ranked choice voting. I think it's gonna help with the, with the districts in a big way. It's gonna help all of us um, and it's gaining momentum in Ohio. And then um, I would put my weight um, behind uh, codifying reproductive rights, abortion rights. That's me personally. Um, um, I, I don't, I would like to hear what other people would be would like to do, um, but that's where I'm at, and um, that's where I feel would make the the best impact 
for the, the issues that I feel are so prevalent right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Free Press has in the past held a, a Progressive People's Congress, and and I would probably feel we're going to do that again before 2024 uh, to pull together uh, some 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 progressive ide people and ideas and bringing it together. Um, Joyette, you you mentioned that the, the issue uh, first. So, want could you maybe share a little bit more where you were going with that, and then and then Morgan and or Carolyn, and then we'll get to Lynn here uh, very quickly. Uh, it's twenty. Yeah, we got about four or five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Just um un un unplug yourself there. Oh, you might not be able to. Stephen, can you can you? D, 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 mute her uh, while we're waiting for that. Yeah, thank you guys um, for your work. Yeah, uh, can I just add one more thing, Mark? Yes, please. Yeah, so the 501c3 friendly thing that we might want to consider is um, coming together to co-host a very large candidate forum event before the main primary. I think you know a lot of folks put energy into trying to educate people on the issues we're better together. So if we can get, you know, a great coalition of orgs, that's a very C3 friendly way because you invite all candidates. And I, and I think that a lot of people could plug in and bring exactly. help bring more attention to the primary. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the, the work in the primaries a lot more is a great idea. And, and but the one, one of the, well, no, not a but, one of the issues have always been sort of a challenge to American uh, elections is ballot access. Um, the real progressive, the real left, the real out of the, uh, the mainstream thinking is usually limited uh, so that you get like this thumbnail uh, distance between left and right um, <laughs> thought in, in, in the political agenda. So um, I don't know. Uh, I think we have enough people in Franklin access? County though that are that get it. So we, the, our challenge is to get them to be willing to run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think well, we have other, people that get the difference. <laughs> yeah, the other issue, yeah, Carolyn, we'll get to you in two seconds. Um, the other issue is that a lot of us are in Franklin County and Franklin County has gone pretty dark, dark, dark blue. Um, and we, we're an island among red. You know, the ocean has is, is surrounded us, sort of the opposite of what Mao said. You know, Mao, Mao always said, you know, circle the city and then we can take it over. But it's sort of the opposite. Actually, it's not the opposite in a way that the right wing has learned to circle the cities and take over. So that how do we how do we run a campaign that's beyond the urbanesque? That well, we, but we, but I guess that was the point I was making, Mark, is we yeah. have a lot of ground to cover in our urban oasis here. Sure, because sure. in the primary, this this May 3rd primary that happened this cycle, there yeah. were 70,000 Democrats that participated, people that showed up and voted for a Democratic, pulled a Democratic ballot. So yeah. that is less than 10% of the overall electorate and, and just about the same number of Republicans pulled a primary ballot. And there mm -hmm. are a lot fewer Republicans in Franklin County. So that's a problem. And yeah. these local yeah. elections are a way to help to drive up those numbers. And as we know, it's in the primary where we determine what kind of Democrat uh, gets through and yeah. in order to compete in the general. And we have examples in this election cycle all over the country of more progressive Democrats running on economic populist messaging. Let's look to the East, Pennsylvania. There was one that got through and one statewide campaign. So, um, mm -hmm. but we, we got to like have the constant organizing and we have a lot more ground to cover, I would say even in central Ohio. Yeah. In the, Frank in the Franklin County Democratic Party, it's really run by a small group of folks and everybody, most of the folks that show up, um, you know, no matter how well-intentioned they are, there's a lot of rubber stamping of what's already been endorsed. In the, and I remember um, I was pretty naive, but they said, do you want to be, um, do you want to be, um, um, screened. And I said, sure. But I'd already told them that I was not for pre-primary endorsements. But once halfway through my um, screening, they said, wait, don't you want to be endorsed? I said, no, I don't believe in being endorsed. I thought they wanted to know what my issues were. And they said, this is over. Thank you. So here we are. We have a party that's locked, but a lot of good people in the 
party that are just kind of going along with it. And we're making inroads. We're, we're not popular. Um, people are like pissed off that we're saying no pre-primary endorsements, but we did have a few, right, Morgan? We had a few um, uh, in districts that, that weren't, um, that they gave folks the choice in the primary. Um, there's like maybe two of them. But mm -hmm. I think the party's realizing that this uh, stranglehold, folks aren't taking it, aren't going to take it any longer, and they want to have a choice. And so um, that way, we, we can have more variety, more progressive people. And that's why it's so important to have you on the Central Committee, Carolyn, and others who did rep your block. Uh, representing different perspectives. So. Yeah, keep but, holding that nose and go to those meetings, please. <laughs> Hold that nose. Uh, we have, uh, we're at 730 now. If you guys can stay on a little bit more, we've been talking about issue-based versus campaign, not versus sort of how, how do we combine the idea of, of uh, people running on their issues in a, in a candidacy. Uh, Lynn uh, Tremonte is with the Ohio Immigrant uh, uh, Alliance and it is in town this week doing interviews with uh, various uh, immigrant communities and individuals and families. And so please share a little bit of your work and, and how, how did the election impact immigration? We know there's, there, that, that was a, a, a serious conversation in a lot of the national uh, campaigning. Uh, and, and a lot of the reasoning is because of our international foreign policies of why we have immigrants coming here. So go ahead, please speak a little bit and then we'll get back to Morgan and, and, and Carolyn on a little bit. And, and Sandy, I know you wanna talk, I don't know, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, okay, go ahead, Lynn. Sure, hi everybody. Um, and Miriam may join me as well, but we're in town. Uh, she and I both are in, in Cleveland, but we're down in Columbus today. Um, and tomorrow, and we're doing a couple of things. One is that we are hosting listening sessions with immigrant parents. Um, this was at the request of a national coalition called the Children Thrive Action Network. Um, they are on a listening tour uh, to talk to immigrant parents about their priorities. And then this coalition will use that to inform their policy agenda and advocacy agenda. So um, we've had one of those sessions today and we have another one tomorrow. And um, I shouldn't talk too much about what, um, what we got into, but a couple of things that really struck me, one was just how concerned for the physical safety of people's children, um, the, the people were, were articulating. So even, before kids even get to school or get to be able to learn, parents are worried about them getting shot in the street, getting shot in their schools. You know, are the five-year-olds getting active shooter training? These are the things that were top of mind for, for the folks we talked to today. We're not even talking about like, is the work too hard or challenging enough, right? So that was really sobering. We also heard that, you know, the as you guys were talking about ballot initiatives, the issue um, about immigrant, the so-called immigrant voter ballot initiative, you know, even though that was actually disenfranchising other people who are not immigrants, and it wasn't, of course, our the messaging wasn't accurate about that. Um, but in fact, it, it it put fear in many immigrant citizens about voting, about going to the polls to vote. You know, so it served its purpose. It scared some people from showing up. Um, and then on the other hand, one of the women in the meeting today was like, I was the third person in line to vote. And she got up at 6.20 a.m. to vote. So, you know, there's the, there's the response of fear. And then there's the response of, no, I have this right. I'm going to use it. Um, so another thing we're doing here this weekend is we are helping people from Cameroon, Haiti, uh, Somalia, and other countries sign up for temporary protected status, which is something that the administration can grant to immigrants from certain countries if it's deemed that sending them back to their country or deporting them would be a, a danger to them or just that, that the country couldn't handle it. So um, we had a legal clinic with you know, some great lawyers, awesome volunteers from all over Columbus and even um, into Morrow County and Licking County and some other places. So 
Um, very excited about the community interest in helping people. We had a great turnout among immigrants. Yeah, unfortunately, maybe half of them didn't qualify for TPS because they entered the country more recently. Um, but they were able to connect with legal advice and sort of understand what other options they had. So um, the, this came about because um, for a very long time, there's been um, a lot of, uh, well, let's just say racism in how TPS was designated. And for Cameroon in particular, I mean, people had to be, you know, the bloody nature of the conflict and the photos and kids being massacred and all of this. And we were still deporting people to Cameroon. So um, a group called the Cameroon Advocacy Network organized the community and demanded TPS and achieved it. Um, and so we were excited to do this clinic because we know that Ethiopia recently was designated for TPS and people from Ethiopia cannot apply yet, but they will be able to soon. So we're, we're kind of learning the lessons of things that worked and things that didn't today to be able to do another clinic for Ethiopian TPS. We are also calling for TPS for Mauritania. And the last thing is we're working on a report about how racism shows up in immigration judge decisions. And if any of you have ever been inside the immigration court and heard the way these so-called judges, you know, do their job, talk to the immigrants that are trying to apply for immigration status, um, you know, it, it's, it's offensive, it's uh, inhumane, it's very callous. Um, you know, if somebody if if somebody's not crying, talking about the trauma that they experienced, and the judge will say that they were. Diff diffident, you know, dissident or whatever the word is, you know, just that they didn't seem like they were really upset. So um, we're working with the research team to um, to identify examples of this because we want to show the Biden administration that they can that the immigration court system does not work, and it you can't say you can't rely on it to protect people who would be in danger if they were deported. So we need much more humanitarian protection. From the administration, we can't we can't leave it to the courts because the courts are not doing it. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, thanks for the work that you and Miriam are doing as well because it's very dynamic. Uh, and you've shared with us on a, several occasions. And please keep coming back and updating us with what the work you're doing and and help us understand where we can step in on that. Uh, yeah, the challenge in elections is. The, the age old uh, reality is uh, America's racist uh, condition. Um, we are very racially based um, and, and many of the policies come out of that. And, and the white man has uh, uh, represented that very well. Um, uh, so Morgan and uh, several other folks have listed several names of people that are progressive that won so progressives can win so where where are we with this um uh challenge of how progressive can we get and where where and when and how and who should run uh carolyn you had a little bit of experience with that do you do you want to talk and then Medea just joined us so we'll get her into this conversation as well yes i i Am I muted or am I good? No, you're good. You're good. Okay. Um, I need to go because my family's waiting yeah. for me. But um, yeah. um, that's why. Um, well, the talk about Tim Ryan and how you know moderate he got, almost Republican, um, and how a lot of Democrats feel that's the way we need to go, um, shows me that we need ranked choice voting more than ever, and that we need to be as progressive and um, as we are but we need an avenue so that folks can vote um, for these issues. And so that's why um, I'm gonna continue to um, learn about this and get involved in that um, because um, the Democratic Party is, I think, heading more moderate, um, even more, more right-wing in my, I mean, if, we, if they feel like what Tim Ryan did, I mean, he's like, like we need more natural gas, you know, he was like, he was becoming like, um, you know, 
I could, I mean, because he was so choice, I could support him, but so many of his issues I couldn't. So yeah, no, I think we need to be progressive and we need to keep fighting for pro progressive parties. And we need to, we need to get ranked choice voting. Um, that way we can actually be on the ballot and folks can actually um, um, vote for what they believe in. Georgia has an interesting uh, uh, system. If they don't get a 50%, they have runoffs. So that, that, that's an interesting perspective, short of ranked choice and short of uh, other uh, changes in the electoral system. That would be an easy thing to do is if you don't get 50%, you don't, you don't get the right to win. Um, so that, that would be a, a quick thing. Uh, and I think would be capable. Um, I know you got to go, Carolyn. Happy birthday! Enjoy. Thank you. Your day. Uh, please uh, keep keep active and keep working with WGRN and keep that 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 work going as best you can. And please reach to us anytime you need some support. Please, please, please. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks for coming in and giving us a reflection. Uh, Morgan, before I jump to Medea, did, did you have anything that you want? I know other folks are wanting to get in and, and Stephen, I don't know, you've got uh, Sandy on stack and others, but I don't know if, you, are you un, unleashing them at, like uh, you can or, because uh, I don't have that policy, I don't think. I don't have that capability. Go ahead, Morgan, uh, and then we'll get to Medea. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to take Sandy's question if. Um... Where's that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I don't know what Sandy's question is though. I think she said it relates to Tammy Wilson's campaign. Wilson, yeah, Sandy's, yeah, Tammy uh, uh, campaign, Tammy's campaign. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I guess the only other thing I would say until Sandy is um, is teed up is, yeah, I, I personally, and you know, we've been having some dialogue in the chat. I think moving in this direction is the only hope of being competitive because people see through the mealy mouth nonsense that you know a lot of um, more traditional folks are putting out there and like people want real ideas and policies that are going to change conditions and that is tackling all of the healthcare disaster that has happened within uh, you know drug prices hospitals that in a lot of I've talked to folks on this before but you know a lot of my work focuses on anti-monopoly policy it's like it's in every every area of the economy is just some very large corporation that is extracting all the value and the rest of us are just kind of scrambling around and trying to survive and that is not sustainable so the more honest we are about that and then the more aggressive we are something about it that's the only way that we're going to be able to touch people where they're at and and counter the faux populism that a lot of the, the far right candidates that JD Vance is putting out, for example. So um, we've got to, yeah, we've just got to continue on with our strategy, but we need to make sure that people know about it and having you know, other types of candidates run and that they get um, the awareness that people will, will actually be able to support. Fantastic, thank, thank you, Morgan. And, and please keep part of this conversation. Uh, Sandy, I see you might have some language. I just remember this is Columbus Free Press, November 12th uh, Salon. Uh, we are on the radio and uh, live Facebook. So please uh, like and, and do whatever you need to do to have that repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, and uh, we are speaking about the elections 2022, but also beyond. What, what does that mean beyond? What, what happened? What happened in the election? But elections, I think, is real good, and we're getting into that—that that campaigning, that 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 creating the, the the need for that money, that that the, the good people to work with, the issues that you take on to the in that candidate's uh, uh, campaign, and then then all the other aspects of how, how do you play the party politics are out there. Do we go without a party? I mean, that that's, you know, work, working families is moving into in Columbus and that's, that's fantastic. That, that'll give us another vote possibly. Greens have, have dissipated themselves off the ballot and, but, you know, still a lot of us are greeny uh, as well. I'm, I'm, I'm actually green, red, and black, but that's where I'm at. But um, uh, Sandy, I think you've got voice now if you'd like to speak. And jo 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 T, I don't know why you didn't get voice, but Stephen, if you could get her up too, possibly. Sandy? Yeah, um, I'm really done with the, I'm not done with the Democratic Party because I think we, the other Democrats, um, the established one is not 
And I just, um, I was working a little bit with Tammy Wilson's campaign. She got no support. So what I see with the established Democratic Party is they're fine with the status quo, which is for them losing, losing, losing. They have, they don't have primaries. They don't have any money. They say even for the major candidates, um, they don't have, they don't give support to people. They don't um, have a work. They don't even have a working number. I tried to call the Ohio Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a working number. I went there. Said, "Why don't you have this? Oh, we're going to get this done pretty soon." I'm talking like six days before the election. Um, they closed their doors. Everything's locked. Security. They said um, they don't have any information on the candidates. No, I know I'm telling you everything you know, right. but I, mean, I just do not see how the. De I think the Democratic Party, those people, not us. Are, um, are just more detrimental to our cause than anything. So um, before we get ranked the vote, I think we need to like recognize that there is this deep division where the progressives and they are the status quo. And um, so the and only thing I would- Am I unmuted? Yeah, you are. Yes. Okay, so I don't live in Ohio anymore. I used to live in Ohio. I'm really new at all of this stuff. I'm passionate, but I don't think I'm as informed as all of you guys are. But it seems to me, that the abortion issue is low hanging fruit. And I think that if you can get that, that on, was on the ballot, it was great. It brought people out to vote. Um, like in Michigan, they, I don't know, you know, they collected signatures and they got people out to vote. It's low hanging fruit, right? right. If I could just, if I could just finish what I was trying to say, um, I, I, cause I, you're totally right on that. But I do think that we have a really good chance. And we've done this. We had that, yes, we can. It's still going, but we don't have anybody running it. Um, do what? Where, we, where the progressives have been out there, out front, and um, getting our message across. And I and Morgan, if you can put in the in the chat, like where this you're having this meeting. Yeah, I got to get the link. I my text situation no problem. But, but I'm, yeah i'm gonna get that and i'm gonna drop it in the chat in but i think this, <laughs> this conversation is so very important today and i'll leave it there but we can do this we've done it before and the the candidates who are out there with the message are yeah. winning and sandy the only thing i would add because i i mostly agree with your analysis but i will say and that was one of the very encouraging things to me in this campaign is you know maybe not in the like franklin county democratic party entirely Though I, I believe even that is changing a little bit in terms of the reaction to different types of candidates, but especially in some of these other counties, I encountered a lot of people who were running parties or one layer below the main centralized, you know, head of the state party that were very open um, to other types of ideas and on board with things like Medicare for all. So uh, I, you know, I don't want us to generalize too much uh, there. I do think that there are folks within the party that are on board. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bot, uh, the bathwater. Uh, folks that Jones leaves by six, anything, you know, pay rental. And only a four vote margin in California's third seat, John Duarte and Adam Gray. Only four. You guys can, uh, Joey, to mute just a second. We're move on to, we're going to move on to uh, Charles your hand and I'll get to you in a second. But we're gonna to move to Medea. Medea Benjamin came through town uh, on, a, on a national tour uh, and she was great here. And I'm sure it went on and on and on and it was very beautiful. And I hope she's not too tired, but uh, thanks for her work. And I, I wanted to bring her in just to follow up on some of the conversation you had. And so Medea, are you ready to uh, jump in on this conversation? You heard a little bit where we're at. so. Uh, this is the uh, Free Press Salon on November 12th, 2022. We just are talking right after the, the midterms uh, elections, and uh, we're looking at local, uh, national, and international impact of what these elections mean. Uh, and uh, Madea, are you ready? I don't see her in here. Is she under another ID? Someone said she was here. I don't see her, but uh, uh, someone said she was here. Yeah, so is she here? <clears throat> I asked if she was here. Oh, I, I saw I saw someone here. So, okay, never mind. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, Charles had a question real quick. I don't know if he can un be unmuted, uh, Stephen. Unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. There you go. <clears throat> okay. Um, the the um, pro-choice 
initiative is a total no-brainer. If the Democratic Party can't even get that right, then the devil with them. See, <laughs> I watched my language. That's a good boy. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> that's got to be done. Because everywhere it's been done, even in red states, it's it, they it wins two to one. Even Kentucky kept. Not two to one. Not two to one, but it was it, it, it did bring people out to vote. That's true. Yeah. Yes, it did. There are a yeah. lot of forked off women in this country on both sides of the political aisle, independence. It doesn't matter. To me, that's a non-political issue. It's a matter of your autonomy, your bodily autonomy. And it's, it's, a, it's a question for everybody, actually, because if they do that to women, who else are they going to do it to? Yep. First, they came, for, they came for me, and I didn't say anything. Then they, they came for you know, the women, and I didn't say anything. Then they came for me. There's nobody around to talk up for me. Yep. It's, it's kind of a crude um, expression of that, but that's pretty yep. much what it is. It's yeah. everybody's issue. Niebuhr, Niebuhr's uh, warning to all of us, it, it lives alive and, and is bold right now. Yes, you're right. Uh, Morgan, are you uh, good with where we're at? Uh, with Thank you for, you did, you did do the link uh, to the Working Families Next meeting. I attended the, the I guess it was called the launch, uh, uh, and it was a great session, had very good people there dynamic uh, community activists uh, start to hear a little bit about what WFP is trying to do. And Elena it does seem to be fairly strong uh, organizer and, and, and I do uh, support uh, her effort uh, uh, in, in the Central Ohio area. And hopefully we can uh, get, get more from that uh, uh, as we move forward. Um, again, um, Morgan, did you have any uh, other words? Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Anyone who can join on the thirtieth, link is there. Sign up. Spread the word. And then I was just going to say on the abortion issue, I put in the chat. But um, you know, there's so there's so many well-funded advocacy organizations that I bet will be moving on this. So I think we'll be in a position to support what they come up with. I don't think this is one that you know we will have to be leading from the ground up or anything like that. Um, so, but yeah agree completely that it obviously made a huge impact in the states where, where they have it and, and hopefully we can get one together in Ohio. Yeah, so locally we are, as Morgan mentioned, we are moving into a different uh, framework of our city council. Uh, we're moving into uh, increasing the numbers of people on the council and um, the way it's uh, elected. It's, it's sort of a hybrid, it's a fake, uh, delegate, uh, delegate based system. Uh, but it is sort of a transition to something new. I don't know where it's going to head up, whether it's going to be good. Uh, do we see any candidates that may be able to jump into those new openings? And, and who do we see replacing uh, Liz Elizabeth uh, Brown as she just jumped off to YWCA? And Brian, I see your hand. So I'll get you in a second. Thank you. Anybody see Brian? Do you do you have a, a response to that, or you got something else? Uh, yeah, I I think it may be someone who is a former council member that may fill in that year. Uh -huh. And keep in mind, this time last year, of the current council members, four of them lived in the same zip precinct. code is stepping down that avoids a contentious primary and election because two the other two of the other three moved to other districts where there are current were previously no council members yeah and we'll see that the other folk move into these uh uh districts uh for lack I have a hard time calling them districts there will be zones in the city that people will have representation supposedly more from uh, those folks um then the mayor is going to be like a hot primary possibly because the other day as at the veterans day parade downtown someone's collecting signatures for tom susi mm, yeah i don't think he's he could i don't know um 
yeah, yeah. That I get there's uh, there's hatred there for uh, of, uh, but he's still you know, and he's still budget, budget in the city, wealth, many social uh, uh, policies that a lot of our progressives agree to. You know, um, in theory, uh, housing. Uh, welcoming communities, uh, health, recreation, uh, personal fun for me. Uh, so, uh, and other aspects. So, it, I don't know uh, whether jumping on a impeach Genther campaign is where a progressive can go or not. I, I'm not. I'm not saying yay or nay to that. I, I, it's not an energy gardening for me and it's not garden gardening great uh energy for me but uh others are and i've seen people out there uh doing that kind of stuff so yeah th there is that um any other formal thinking on this or, or let's see it's uh almost eight and we usually try to get done around eight and then we open up for more informal conversation morgan again thanks for jumping on uh and for all the work that you've been doing uh, uh, with Stand Up uh, Columbus and, and even before that, even, you know, when you were in the DC area doing your, your, your consumer protection work, that the so important stuff that uh, you bring to any can candidacy that you would do. And I'm, I'm, I encourage you to, to hopefully some of these local things that are coming up uh, soon and your name. And that's one thing that we do need to know is that Progressives have to, I mean, all candidates have to have some kind of uh, name recognition. And, and Morgan, I think you're doing the good getting out there and, 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 and getting your name out there is very important, uh, even beyond uh, a candidacy uh, to do work. Um, so, yeah, so we are at eight o'clock or two minutes to till eight. Uh, does anyone else have their fingers up anywhere? I'm trying to catch up, steer clear of Tom's. Yeah, I know. I know, I know, <laughs> yeah. And someone mentioned that in the, yeah. Um, yes, Morgan, thank you again. And Lynn, I don't know if you're still on. Do you have any final words on where, where your work is going on? I know, Michael, I see you're fingering up a little bit. That, uh, I don't know if Lynn's on anymore or not, but she's her work and Miriam's work is just outstanding and, and and the documents that they come out with that kind of interviews and and conversation story collecting and that that's one thing that is getting more, and more uh, popular the progressive agenda is we got stories we got we got things that uh, the, the people want to hear and so we really need to really uh, uh, get that ability to, to tell some good stories, tell good stories to, to, to really advance the policy. Go ahead, Michael. I saw your finger. Up. Uh, yeah, I met last night at Dick's Den with some old, I convened some old reporters and we went over, especially the Ryan race. And um, one thing that came to be a consensus is, well, you are in Ohio and it's a tough slog, but he did, of course, outspin J.D. Vance. And I had heard this and brought it forth that J.D. Vance, the national GOP was quite pissed off at him because he was a lazy fundraiser and didn't campaign hard enough, especially the first like five months of the campaign. And he just thought he was entitled to it, to the set, um, money that was going to go to Oz went into Ohio. So if there's a silver lining that there was something that came out of the Ryan campaign was that. I agree with everybody that said, uh, where was the abortion issue, a referendum? I don't think the Democrats got out the vote. They didn't go in. I was in, I live in a largely African-American community and beside me as well. Uh, there were no door knocks. There was no real great outreach into that. That know this, talking to people in that community, they said the judgeships make a big difference. I think going forward, Democrats need to bring the judges into those communities, at least the ones that can say that they're Democrats, and that's a foot in the door. And that's about it. I was we were just dissecting the campaign last night, and that's what came forth on all that. 
that that's a very important uh, aspect that a a competitive campaign, a competitive uh, election, does draw other resources in and and um, takes away possibly. So you know we may not win locally here, but the advancement of you know taking that money from uh, Oz probably helped Fetterman get in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maintain some kind of thing. Heather, I see you jumping around a lot on or not. Um, and she, you've offered a few, uh, I endorse uh, so solutions. Um, I don't know if you're. But OK, um, I'm get on. No. Uh, so with that, the, hmm. we do. No, we do know that elections are not the end of all, uh, but they do set those who are at the table. The, so it does set the table setting, you know, that the, those are the ones that are at the table uh, eating up all of us. Because, <laughs> you know, if you're not at the table, you're getting eaten up. That, that's, that's the old adage. So how do we join a table, the progressives join the table and uh, really push those agendas out there uh, is by continually growing our voice and our ability to articulate the the real life stories we know we see and and work with and and work around. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know. Does anybody else have uh, their insights of what they want to say today? Uh, we are at eight oh two now. And this is Columbus Free Press, uh, November 12, 2022, talking about the midterm elections and uh, the impact that they had have, they, they may have or have on uh, local, uh, national and international. Um, we haven't really talked much about the international, but a little bit of it was the, the immigration issue will be uh, a change. I mean, uh, the former uh, president, uh, the dude down in uh, Mar-a-Lago, he, he limited uh, the amount of legal immigration. The, 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 president, the present president, he is talking about increasing, but increasing the number of, of annual uh, immigrants uh, that are allowed in. But still, Heather, I see you've got voice now. So do you have other, uh, other uh, direction you wanna go with that? Yeah, I don't know what I, I, doing, I hadn't muted. really oh, go ahead. had anything particular to add. Okay. Um, I just thought you were jumping around a lot and you'd thrown in stuff in the chat. Yeah. So I just wanted to add an opportunity. Oh, well, yeah. I'll I'll chat. I I'm 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 from far from Ohio. So well, we're talking I don't I don't have so much to to add to to your more local no but we thing. just about the national and international impacts of the elections. So do, do you, where do you see the, the elections in your, your quote unquote neck of the woods? I hate that term, but that's what everybody says on our local media. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Massachusetts. Massey, yeah. Cool. <laughs> so you got a so, new guy. Yeah, she was my third choice. <laughs> <laughs> there were two other women at that dropped out yeah. um, who would have been, I think, better choices, but yeah. there you are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I also wanted um, someone else for attorney general. I really, 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 really wanted someone else for secretary of the Commonwealth. But that was not to be. Um, so on balance, I'm still doing better, but you know, my the current governor is is very obviously a Republican. Mm -hmm. He just vetoed um, money to um, to point out how much crisis pregnancy centers lie. 
So mm. there we are. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, Nevin, Nevin is with us too. Our our resident uh, uh, Mexican uh, political commentator uh, extraordinaire, uh, Nevin. I know you're you're a little bit. You're, you're texting me back and forth. What what? Are, how are you guys viewing what happened in the in the states? Uh, the, the state. The, the, I mean, I'm sure there's been some kind of talk uh, among those that are active. Uh, what is this? What what is the local, national, and and uh, uh, what is the impact on uh, that whole thing? If you want to share, I don't. I don't uh, if you thank you. I didn't expect to be invited. No, I know. I just been here this evening. Um, yes, it, the state that I, I recently retired to on the Caribbean coast uh, just <clears throat> decriminalized. Uh, a woman's right to uh, choose whether to end a pregnancy. It's overwhelming that uh, <clears throat> to see in the United States uh, the supposedly like country is taking that away, whereas this supposedly uh, hard, hard stainless steel religious country is <clears throat> moving the on those things, despite the false pseudo progressiveness of the uh, <clears throat> the government, uh, it's the same pre we've had for a million years, just changes colors. But uh, even so, some things cannot be stopped. These are <clears throat> ideas that still have to uh, <clears throat> move forward, and yet, no, <laughs> in your country, in the country I grew up in, in Columbus, Ohio, this. It's inconceivable. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, we, um, you we never... don't have anything like for primary elections. They, uh, <clears throat> there's hardly such a thing. Um, the electoral arena is much more closed. <clears throat> there are a few political parties, and they, it's almost impossible for independents to uh, be on the ballot as. Only the last few years has it happened that it's uh, not really taken seriously. They're just uh, members of other parties who uh, take off their their collars to sort of run independently. The um, <clears throat> but the, there is no petitioning or things like that. Um, that was my comment before when I was, lived in the United States. I was a member of a very small party. And the petition process was just a mere excuse to be able to go out in the street and talk to people about all the issues that that group stood for. That stood for it no longer exists. So that, that's thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a whole other twist on the benefit of these regular campaigns, elections that do happen. It does give a moment in time and a space for conversation that. Uh, Progressives do need to jump in that vacuum, that 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 narrow, one, two, test one, two. skinny, skinny uh, uh, discussion that is pointed out at, at mainstream media and other places. That you know they say this is left, but it's like no, that's not left. That's that's not even close to left. That's not even progressive. What you're calling left, and that you know right. That no, that's not right because what's actually in place is much farther over, right? Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the expansion of political discourse is that very uh, challenging when you, when you sometimes talk about elections, but we need to rush into that, you know, fools rush in where, uh, you know, <laughs> but angels fear to tread, they say. Um, so, Anybody else? Thank you, Nevin, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Um, Nevin, Nevin, you have actually, I'll be visiting for Christmas. Yeah, fantastic. Do you have any, uh, statement on Lulu winning Brazil. Me? Doubt, yeah, you, you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 nothing in particular. Well, not just not the, just Luke. The, no. There were progress. The, the pink tide continues in Latin America. Right. Um, in Colombia, there was a recent election also, where somebody uh, 
not so conservative was elected. Uh, Venezuela is still <clears throat> uh, a pole of attraction in America, in Latin America. Um, uh, the person, the right winger who was the president for many years, uh, Bolsa, Bolsonaro, uh, threatened to not release, uh, not, to not turn over the office, but that seems to just have been bravado. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was funny how uh, some folks have called this election in the United States, you know, that, that I think they're using the term pink tide, but they called it the pink trickle. <laughs> meaning it wasn't the red wave that they thought it was going to happen. And in Ohio, you know, we did get some interesting results, not on the statewide levels. I mean, the statewide candidacies all went Republican uh, without hesitation. But some of the uh, local uh, uh, congressional delegate, the congressional delegates, delegation from Ohio has definitely increased its uh, gender and racial diversity. Uh, Suzanne, go ahead, please. Can you release her, please, Stephen? Thank you. Oh, I can release myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was just gonna uh, say that I'm sorry that Medea didn't come. I don't know what yeah. happened there. Yeah, I don't uh, know. But that's okay. But she was in town uh, last month, and those of you that made it there and heard her heard a really good talk about Ukraine, and I just wanted to put a plug in. Thank you. book, which is backwards, but it's called War in, Re War in Ukraine, uh, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. And Bob and I finished reading it. If anybody wants to borrow our copy or you can order one online, but it does give a good uh, rundown about uh, what's happening behind the scenes in Ukraine. Thank you. Yeah, this, the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine uh, is something that has really caused uh, splinters, and we, I came in that splinterish conversation uh, as we were coming on, as I was coming on like a little before seven, uh, within our own community, uh, where are we supposed to be standing, where, where are we supposed to do, what, what, where are we at on this whole uh, conflict that's going on, uh, and her book does break things down very well. Um, uh, Stephen, your hands up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, off the topic. Um, Columbia, uh, Ohio counts her votes that are mailed in early, if I remember right. I went, so that's why the elections were decided so quickly. But, you know, I looked online, it was like 93% of the votes were counted. And yet, um, Ryan was only down by 6%, and he already conceded. Right. Does that make sense? It's like they just, People just seem like they don't give us a chance, you know, but who knows? I, you, know. You, got, you sort of have to understand <clears throat> the ocean that is outside of us, uh, outside of the, the it's urban areas. There's a strong well, ocean. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what the, well, one of the big problems with the Democratic Party is. They listen to their consultants too much. And in my opinion their consultants aren't worth a bucket of spit and i'm being nice saying a bucket of spit yeah and you know what i'm saying yeah and a lot of them aren't even in ohio so that that's another whole oh, no world. they're not they're all in washington and yeah, they are not run on local energy they're run on uh nope. natural and who knows where from money um so that, that my friend has to change if the democratic party wants to be relevant and they want to draw all these young millennial voters, these young kids, 20 somethings, they're gonna to have to change that. If they don't know where they're at and they're trying to do everything from the top in an office in DC, you know, that's not gonna work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is an interesting, uh, to get back to the Ukraine thing, it, it is an interesting, I don't know if it's interesting, but uh, I don't know if the right term is, um, the the trump esque congressional folks are calling for an end or reduction on u.s support not for the right reasons but that there is that anti-war uh, uh populism that is uh is being garnered within the, Mark, the they're only against the war because it's not their war okay their we'll, heart is def totally not in the right place yeah this is a question of a country, a sovereign nation 
was invaded actually twice in 2014 and recently. Okay. Well, it, it was invaded it, by a proxy force of mercenaries. It's the first time the army went ahead and did it the second time. Yeah. And they have a right to defend themselves, and NATO's right to defend to, 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 to provide them, provide them the capability they need to defend themselves. And they're doing a pretty darn good job of it. The, yeah. Russians are, the Russians are in trouble. Putin's in trouble. You mark my words, in three or four months from now, Putin's going to have to back off because there's going to be pressure within his own country to do so. And I'm talking to pressure in his professional military. They're already, yeah. they're, they're not stupid. They're professional soldiers, okay? They see what's going on in that battlefield. Yeah. They don't have tactics. They don't have leadership. The Ukrainians have plenty of that, and even though they got less resources, mm -hmm. they're, they're winning. Yeah, I don't really know if we know the total in intent of why uh, uh, the Russian uh, special military operation took place, uh, but there is definitely reasoning why. Uh, the U.S. and NATO have responded as they've done. Um, they have long history. Yugoslavia, Libya, um, you know, uh, have have definitely given the light, the green light to NATO to. Well, um, Libya, Libya they, was an abuse of NATO, of NATO because that was done for the British and French who depend yeah. on Libyan oil. And we I all was, know about Gaddafi and the gold dinar. That's what that was all about. Yeah, I would, Ukraine is the same way. It's being, it's NATO is abusing itself there as well, or abusing that, you know, when they start saying we're going to fight well, to the left. I, I don't think, I don't think so because that's in their, that's in their, yeah. okay, Libya wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we can, we, we could, we could, um, the Ukrainians could have available to them artillery rockets that could reach into Russia, but we won't give them to them. And that's a prudent move because we don't want to escalate it to that point. We want the Russians to figure out, the Russian professional military to figure out Putin's a bad deal and they need to get rid of him internally, then everything will be fine. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like we, the word we uh, sometimes gets overused. And, and, and I don't know if there yeah. is a, a clear understanding of what the uh, progressive community nor the left of the United States, where we stand on this particular issue, the existence of NATO just in general to, to more particular about this, uh, this war that's going on. Well, I, um, I, see, a, I see basically a, a, an organized crime gangster, which Putin is, yeah. using a, a, a military to, you know, to just bully. He, he yeah. wants to 